All right. Can you introduce yourself, Does please? It make me have more hair. Um, <laughs> no. Oh, all right. <laughs> uh, I'm Tracy Bastrochea. I'm a chief of police, currently chief of police with Meridian Police Department. And Tracy, can you talk a little bit about uh, your life growing up and uh, what kind of brought you to law enforcement? Yeah, so um, kind of to go back, I grew up in a small uh, farming ranching community, um, Goody, Idaho. Uh, my, my dad had a uh, trucking company and he had started out, he originally came to this country in 1952 on a sheep herding contract. He was 17 years old. Um, our background is we're Basque, so we're really, I'm the first generation, my, me and my brothers here in the United States, but um, my dad, uh, my grandfather came here in 1919 on a sheep herding contract, and he went back to the Basque country and met my grandmother. Uh, they were married. They had a farm, small farm there, and he worked in a sawmill there and um, started their family. Uh, they had four boys and a, and a daughter. And so as my dad was growing up, he was born just before the Spanish Civil War broke out. And so um, right after he was born, well, two years after he was born, they had the bombing of Guernica, which was a very famous bombing pre-World War II, where Hitler um, was working with Mussolini and with Francisco Franco, the dictator of Spain, and they carried out what is known as the first civilian bombing um, in, the his in history. And my father was involved, it was in that bombing, he was a little boy, um, his mother hid under a bridge with him. Um, with the bombs going off around them in the countryside. And so after the war was over, um, it was not very, wasn't a good place to be if you were Basque. Um, they outlawed speaking Basque in public. Um, if you were caught speaking Basque in public, you may get beaten, you may get killed and left on the side of the road, put in prison. Um, I uh, met a guy, became friends with a guy. His father was actually born in prison. His mother was caught speaking Basque on the street and they threw her in prison while she was pregnant with him. Um, really a, a, a rough time. And so my grandfather, knowing that, um, he decided that he wanted to uh, get his boys at least to the United States. And so he gave a picture of himself to another Basco that was coming to the United States to sheep herd and told him, hey, will you show this, the guy I worked for, show him this picture, see if he'll bring me back. And they remembered my grandfather and were like, yeah, he was a great worker. We'll, we'll get him back over here. So my grandfather came and then he brought my brother or my, my dad, who was the oldest of the boys, he brought him first. And so my dad started uh, herding uh, sheep um, down in the Gooding area. And the, the things that I remember the most talking with my dad about herding um, sheep and talking to my grandpa as he talks about one night they're sitting in, in camp and it's the height of the Cold War. And my grandpa's telling him, hey, you don't know how lucky you are to be in the United States of America. He, he tells my dad, he says, you know, in this country, you can make whatever you want to make of yourself as long as you work hard and you're honest. And, and my dad being 17, seventh grade education, you know, realizes there's another superpower out there. And he asks my grandpa, he says, but what about the Soviet Union? Um, they're the other superpower. And I thought it was so telling for coming from just a sheep herder, right? He tells my dad that government will never last. That country won't last because you can't keep your thumb on a people forever and not expect them to rise up against the government. And so I thought it was just very, very um, prophetic coming from, um, again, someone that with no education, but had got to see the different parts of the world and the different parts of the government. And so um, from there, my dad went into, um, was a started a trucking company hauling hay, and then eventually went into hauling swinging beef and uh, refrigerated trucking. And so growing up, my brothers and I um, worked at our dad's shop, you know, changing truck tires. We always teased my son. We were always cleaning bloody meat hooks and changing truck tires. He doesn't know how rough uh, we had it. Um, but, but we worked in the shop. Uh, a lot of times we worked for different farmers around the area, picking rock, moving pipe, doing those types of things. So we learned a lot about working hard early on. And, you know, a lot of people, um, you know, they really like my mom and dad. They are great people. They're very generous people. But man, my dad was hard on us. That 
he, he was hard on us. He did not give you, uh, give you an inch um, when it came to work or those things. Um, got the belt a few times, no doubt about it. Deservedly so, I guess. But gave us a solid respect for authority and, and for the government in the United States. Um, very big deal for our parents, for us to be involved. It was a big deal when we turned 18 and, and you got to vote and do those things. That was always very stressed, very highly in our family. And so I've kind of carried that on with my son as well. Um, so growing up, though, those were the things, you know, working hard. Um, we were all involved in athletics. Um, uh, got involved in the martial arts when I was really young in elementary school and then was really involved in wrestling and, and football growing up and um, just come in time for uh, graduation from high school. I wasn't real sure what I was going to do. Um, I knew that I either wanted to go into law enforcement or I wanted to teach school and be a wrestling coach. And so that was kind of the, the crossroads that I was at. My brother had been a police officer for quite a while and at the time was a, a police officer with the Boise Police Department. And he told me, best advice, probably the only good advice he's ever given me. Uh, he, he told me, he said, whatever you do, he said, don't get your degree in criminal justice. He said, if you get your degree in criminal justice, you're going to be able to be a cop or a probation officer, and that's pretty much it. And if you don't like those jobs, you really don't have anything to fall back on. And he said, told me, he said, go out, get your degree in education, and then if you decide you want to be a cop, then go be a cop, right? You, you'll still have that degree. It'll help you advance in law enforcement. He said, but if you don't like being a cop, you can go back and teach school and go back to coaching wrestling. And so um, while I was going to school at Boise State, um, I wrestled there for a short time. And then uh, I was doing a lot of ride-alongs with my brother. And I still wasn't real sure what I wanted to do. But one night on a ride-along with him, um, we get a, a car burglar in the north end of Boise. And we roll up on him and we catch him. And I don't think twice about it. I bell out of the car and chase this dude down and tackle him in the front yard, right? And so I've tackled this guy as my brother's sergeant is pulling up, Gary Compton. And Gary had some choice words for my brother. And, and my brother was just like, what could I do? I, he goes, I didn't have time to tell him not to chase him. He was out of the car and chased the guy. And I was kind of hooked at that point. You know, I was like, hey, this is pretty cool. Maybe this is the route I want to go. And then uh, another night we had had an armed subject and it was just my brother and I and his backup was a ways away. And I, uh, I can tell this now that he's retired, but he unlocks the shotgun and gives me the shotgun. And he goes, you know how to use it. He goes, if this do something happens, he goes, you need to use the shotgun if, if it comes down to that. And I'm like, okay. And so I hear I've got this shotgun trained on this car. And then we hear the backup starting to show up. My brother's like, put that shotgun away. <laughs> so we put it away. And I, I was kind of sold on, the, on it at that point. I really uh, started seeing more and more of what law enforcement was really like, not like it was on TV. And uh, really seeing the effect that police officers could have on people, the positive effect uh, that police officers could have on people. And um, the Meridian Police Department was hiring. And much to my wife's chagrin, um, I applied and got hired. She was pretty certain. She had moved up here from California. Um, and she was pretty certain she was going to marry a teacher who taught school coached wrestling and fought fire for the BLM in the summer because that's what I did in college uh, for the summer or over the summers is I would work construction and then I worked uh, fighting fire for the Bureau of Land Management Wildland Fires. And uh, so when I said, hey, guess what? This is right before we get married. I tell her, just got hired as a cop in Meridian. And she's like, I didn't even know you'd apply to be a cop in Meridian. So we were married in June of 1996. And I started in September of 1996 as a police officer. So she's been with me the entire ride. So just a quick um, background for the listeners and, um, uh, and viewers. Can you talk about 1996? How big is Meridian? Where is it located? And how big is Meridian now? Yeah, 1996, when we start, Meridian is probably maybe 15,000 people, maybe not even quite that big. 
real small town. Um, we're in the middle of the Treasure Valley, but at that time when I say the middle of the Treasure Valley, driving to Boise seems like it's a long drive. Driving to Nampa seems like it's a long drive and CUNA and vice versa. I mean, it's it's really a small, small town. Um, you go down Eagle Road and, and Fairview in that area now, we're at 140,000 people. Um, and we have the two busiest or three busiest intersections in the entire state of Idaho. Eagle Road and Fairview, when I started, was literally, it is one of the busiest intersections in the state. It was all farmland. Everyone, it was, it was, it was, uh, there was a dairy out there, um, cornfields, everyone was pheasant hunting out there, two lane road, uh, and now it's a five lane highway basically going through the city with just tons of commercial development around it. Uh, I always laugh because uh, when we would always tell everybody, when you work graveyard back then, uh, usually about there was usually two of you on and one of you would go off about 3 a.m. And, and in the winter time, you would go out and after 10, there was no traffic on the, on the roads in Meridian. So in the winter, you would go out and literally look for tire tracks after midnight because you knew somebody was up to no good and you were going to go find them. And it was usually the newspaper carrier. Um, so it, it was small, real small. I think there was maybe uh, 20 officers at the time. We have 143 sworn officers now and we have about I think it's about 43 uh, professional staff that work for us as well, including uh, code enforcement officers and um, community service officers as well. So we've grown exponentially. Okay. So in 96, can you talk about the training that you initially yeah. got and then how you started? Yeah. So back then, everybody went to uh, a police academy that was run by the state of Idaho. It was about 10 weeks long. Um, just to be honest, it, it, it taught to the lowest common denominator because you're dealing with people right from all spectrum, one man police departments to, you know, to at the time Boise City, which was considered a large police department at that time, even. And so uh, you're, you're dealing with all kinds of people. You learn brand law. Uh, which was interesting because uh, a lot of the guys you got there, you know, going through that academy had never even seen a cow or a horse, so they had no idea what they were looking at anyway. But you had to learn brand law, you had to learn fish and game law, all of those things. And so that's changed a lot. You got that 10 weeks of training, and quite frankly, once you were out of there, you didn't get a whole lot of training at our department then. You, you were lucky if you got to go out of town once in a great while you got a little bit of yearly training um, but uh, now uh, sometimes I laugh because our guys complain that they get too much training and it's like yeah that's a good problem to have I guess um, so it changed a lot uh, for sure you, you really relied on what you already knew. That's why I, I always felt very, very fortunate. Um, I, I had done a little bit of boxing growing up. I was really involved in wrestling, had done martial arts growing up and, and through college and uh, was still involved in, in wrestling and the martial arts and those things. And so I felt pretty comfortable even for, I mean, I was a little guy then. I'm not a huge guy now, but I was a little guy. I probably weighed 140 pounds when I became a police officer and uh, but I, I felt really comfortable you know going hands-on with people um, just because I trained it all the time still do to this day um, still continue to train and and teach and so okay and so when you start you start off on patrol can you give me an idea yeah. with as small as Meridian is yeah. at that time what kind of what kind of calls are you taking yeah you, you know it's funny it was really small, but I, I can tell you this, we were handling the same calls as other cities, just not as much volume. The very, uh, I mean, literally, the, the I, I come in and I have to do a uh, PT test before the Post Academy. I'm starting the Post Academy on Monday, and I think this is a Friday. And I go do the PT test and I'm on my way home. My wife and I were renting a place and I'm coming down Meridian Road and I see all these cop cars out at this pawn shop place and this and this RV place. I'm like, oh wow, I wonder what's going on, you know. And I get home and I'm sitting at home and I get a call. We've had a, a robbery homicide at the pawn shop shooting. And I'm like, wow, I haven't even been through any training and they call me to basically 
stand guard on the perimeter, right? Man, I was so excited to go. I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. So that's literally the very first thing that really I, I get to go on. And I'm like, man, th this is going to be a really cool career. And so those were the calls really that we, we dealt with then. A lot of domestics um, back then, um, you know, uh, we, we had a place called the Kit Kat. It was a uh, strip club, not a high-end strip club, trust me. And we used to get calls out there to fights all the time, and it was out in the county. And so you loved going out there because we were usually the closest one that ones there. And we'd go out there from the city, and we'd get to do all the fun stuff, get physical, go hands-on, and then we wipe our hands of it and leave. And here's the poor county guys that are having to take all the paper and do all the heavy lifting. And so, so those, were, those were really fun times. Um, my very first day of FTO was interesting because they were excited because I spoke Spanish. And they were like, oh, man, we got someone that can speak Spanish. This is going to be great. The very first call we go on is a domestic. And I'm with a sergeant um, who's actually retired as a lieutenant here. And he's a current city councilman, John Overton. And we go on this call, and it's a domestic. And the people there are hearing impaired. And John's like, oh, man, we're going to have to call somebody to translate. And he turns around, and I was signing with the victim of the domestic. And John looks at me and goes, I had no idea that you knew sign language. And I said, well, no one ever asked me. I didn't think that it'd be important to tell you. And so it was kind of funny that um, rather than Spanish, which everybody expected would be this great uh, thing to have, is I ended up using my, my sign language quite a bit. So, and, and how did you know sign language? So in Gooding, there's a, they have the state school for the deaf and blind there. So growing up, we would have some interactions with some of the kids from that school. And then as we got into high school, some of those kids would come and play football with us. And so I learned just a little bit um, from that. But then I was fighting fire for the BLM, and we had a, a guy on our crew. He was a deaf, deaf guy, really great guy. Kenny Anderson's his name. Just a phenomenal guy. And he really wanted to become a crew boss, but he couldn't be a crew boss unless there was someone there that could sign for him and, and run the radio for him, right? Because he was hearing impaired. And so I was like, heck, I'll do it. I'll, I'll try it out. And we were on a light engine at the time. So uh, Kenny had me go get a, a, a sign language book from the College of Southern Idaho. And we literally spent our entire summer driving, working a uh, fire patrol and practicing sign language. And, and, and you know, um, I, I did it because he was just such a good guy. I was like, this guy should be a crew boss. And was one of the best things I ever did. Um, and really, I think that was one of those things that I really got from my parents. Um, they were so generous to people. And so, I mean, you know, my dad was such a hard worker. Six and a half days a week, that guy worked. Our Everyone else gets to go to Disneyland for vacation or go visit the Grand Canyon. Our vacation was usually going to a Basque picnic in Elko, Nevada for two days or going to Winnemucca, Nevada for a couple days. That's our summer vacation, right, for these Basque festivals, and which were fun. My dad was a, a weightlifter, one of the Basque weightlifters. Um, was pretty successful at it. My grandpa was really successful at it in the old country. And so that kind of came up. Um, through all of this as well, but my parents were really generous and my mom especially uh, would just go out of her way to help people and cook for people and um, just invite people over and feed them. My football team the night of a game would go eat at my, a bunch of guys would come to my mom's house and she would cook for all of us uh, before the game. Uh, that's just who she was and I, I remember at her funeral uh, the priest asked, if you've ever had Doris's cooking, would you please stand up? And I'm not kidding you, every person in that church stood up in that church because she just, that's who she was. If you had a death in your family, my mom was bringing you her Basque rice. I literally had a guy tell me one time, sometimes I hope that someone in our family dies just so I can eat your mom's Basque rice. And so that's really, I think, kind of where I got that idea of, man, I'll help this guy out and, and, and learn sign language and not even realizing how much it was going to benefit me. And it really has benefited me hugely. So. Yeah, so just curious, I mean, besides that one incident, was there other incidents in your career where that helped? Yeah, I, I didn't realize it, but here in Meridian, there's actually a, a fairly large um, hearing impaired community. And so um, I, I've got to use it on 
several occasions actually, and have been called to translate. And every once in a while, somebody out of the blue will be like, an officer will be like, I, this is a really weird thing, but I heard that you understand, you know, sign language. Can you help me out? I'm like, sure. Uh -huh. And uh, interesting thing is we have a, we just put some officers in uh, SROs in elementary schools. And uh, one of our officers who, I don't know who he heard it from, but he told me, hey, I have some hearing impaired kids and I heard you understand sign language. Is there something you could give me? And I still have that book. And I was like, man, start using this book and just, you know, use it. And so. Huh. Kind of a cool, cool experience, really. Not even thinking that that would be something that I would ever utilize, other than with Kenny and the other people that I actually knew on a personal basis. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about your career progression. So from patrol, do you progress to another uh, unit? How does that work? Yeah. So I started out in patrol, and um, they had started the drug recognition expert program in Idaho. And you were supposed to, I think, have three years on and um, some other things. And I had had like a year on. And our, our chief could be pretty convincing to people. Um, he had a pretty strong personality. And he gets me into DRE school, right? I mean, I'm a new cop. I really, I'm like, what in the world, you know? And DRE was tough. That was a tough program. So uh, it was a very long program. And, and the way it works is basically you're an expert on DUIs, but not just alcohol DUIs, but people under the influence of other drugs. And so you go through all of this training and then they send you to, and it teaches you uh, different ways that the drugs, that drugs affect the body and, and, and physiologically. And so they send you to field trials and they send you out and they, it's funny, we, mine were in Fresno, but we'll send them to Seattle and places that have a large population of drug addicts. And they basically go out to the community that they know are all drug addicts and they tell them, hey, if you come by, we'll give you a, a sandwich and a Gatorade if you'll let these guys perform a test on you and, and check your blood and your urine and we won't arrest you. We won't, and man, they line up. And they come in, and so you run them through all of these tests. I mean, and it's intense. I mean, you're taking blood pressure, uh, you're taking heart rate, you're you're checking their their pupil and how it responds to light and how it responds to dark. I mean, a very very intensive um, testing process. And then you have to predict what category of drugs they were under the influence of. And you had to be successful. I think it was 95 percent of the time. And so you go through all of that, and when you're successful to complete that, then you have a written test that takes like three or four hours. And so did that, and I'll never forget it because the first uh, drug DUI I get, it's, it's kind of hilarious. We pull, this lady is actually, she drives up on a sidewalk, and someone actually cuts her off because they're like, holy cow, they're obviously under the influence. Arrive on scene. I get her out of the car and I, I run her through some tests out in the field and I instantly know she's under the influence. And I tell her, ma'am, I'm placing you under arrest for being under the influence. And, and I am handcuffing her and I have this crotchety old sergeant, right? And he's like, what do you mean she's under the influence? He tells her, blow in my hand. And so she blows in his hand, right? And he's trying to smell for alcohol. And he's like, she hasn't been drinking. And I go, yeah, I know that. She's under the influence of whatever it was. And he was like, didn't buy into that at all. He's like, that's all voodoo. This is ridiculous. And so that, but that was my first experience with it, you know. And, and now, I mean, it is, it's a huge program for our department and other departments around, around the state. And so I, I got to be involved in that really um, early on and became a DRE instructor with them as well. And then really not a whole lot longer after that, uh, the DEA, the Boise resident office has, was just starting a, a drug enforcement task force here. And, um, I got chosen to, uh, go be part of that task force and, uh, had a blast, <laughs> had an absolute blast doing that again, very beneficial be speaking Spanish, um, got to do a lot of undercover work, uh, which was great and, and got to travel, um, all over the Western United States, you know, down into Arizona, Phoenix area, Oakland, um, Portland, Seattle, all over. Um, did a lot of undercover work for DEA and case agent work as well, and as well as with the uh, Boise Area Narcotic, Narcotics Drug Interdiction Team, or Bandit as it was called, and and the state police. And um, 
just that was a great experience. I absolutely loved it. Maybe a little too much. So how, how, how old were you when you started that task force? I think I started the task force. I was about 28 years old. Um, I started law enforcement late. I, I was about 26 when I started in law enforcement and was in patrol literally for those two years and then went right into the task force. So can you talk a little bit about you're 28 years old. You've never done undercover before. What was your, what was your thoughts about, about that? You know, I wasn't sure. Um, I wasn't sure uh, what what that was going to look like. And when I first got on the task force, uh, it, it was kind of interesting. I didn't have a whole lot of uh, mentoring initially. And um, it was kind of, I don't think that they knew exactly what it was going to look like or what it should look like or anything like that. And so... Um, kind of was on the periphery for a little bit, just kind of watching and seeing how the cases worked. And I, I remember there was an agent there, Tony Hinton, and the guy was, he, he was gr most knowledgeable person you could ask for. Um, I mean, he knew DEA's rules inside and out better than I think their OPS guys knew them and knew how to work around them. Uh, in an appropriate manner. Uh, for instance, like if it was a, a buy that really we knew ultimately a case was going to go the federal direction, he knew that they wouldn't maybe fund that buy because it, you weren't buying enough at the time. So he knew which ones he could get them to bite off on and which ones the locals had to come up with the money to do and then they would adopt those cases. And But I remember going on a surveillance um, with him and uh, another guy who I loved, Jack Catlin, who's over at the state police still. And uh, I go out there, right? And I, I have no idea. I mean, I'm young. I, I don't, I'm not asking questions. I'm just, I'm just along for the ride. And they're like, oh, you're in your own car. And I get in there. I don't even have a radio, right? I don't have their frequency. So I'm out there trying to figure out what's going on. And I'll never forget at the end of the night, right? We were all doing surveillance. Tony Hinton says, so you didn't have a radio with the state's frequency, huh? And I'm like, nope. And he says, I'll bet that never happens again. And he was right. It never happened again. <laughs> and uh, it was a good time. I mean, I worked with some characters over there. So can you give me a little bit of background at the time? What is a large case? What are you guys working on specifically for the task force? What, what at that time is, is a big case? Yeah, so, so meth was king back then. I mean, meth was king. And we, we had all, we had a lot of different cases. Uh, you know, we did a lot of meth labs, mom and pop meth labs, you know, Beavis and Butthead meth labs that weren't producing a whole lot of, of meth. But then we worked, um, some other ones. We, we worked a guy who came, uh, came in from Oregon and had been affiliated with, uh, HA and he literally brought a P2P lab in a, uh, U-Haul truck and was getting ready to set it up at a little farmhouse at just outside of uh, um, outside of Meridian, which was a former house of a captain from Ada County Sheriff, which was kind of kind of funny when we arrested him. But but that was a big lab, going to be a big lab. Had the triple neck beakers, all those those things, you know, flasks and things. Um, but then we were buying pounds of meth um, from Mexican national organizations, and and we worked a huge uh, investigation at the time. Was uh, I think the largest in the Northwest. We arrested man, probably 40 or 50 people out of that case. Um, you know, at one point we, we took $27,000 cash um, off of an interdiction stop that we did, uh, seized 32 pounds of meth off of one of the uh, search warrants that we did locally, um, caught a guy with like 32 and a half pounds in Iowa who had dropped off 64 pounds in Caldwell, Idaho. And I mean, it was a, it was a really cool case and it was a really um, broad ranging case in that you just, you had all different kinds of people involved in it, right? We, we had our, our guys uh, in that case, they ended up killing a guy in uh, Tijuana who was their source. They'd gotten a load taken off uh, out of Jordan Valley and, uh, the, our, our main guy that we were buying from, his brother-in-law was kind of the next level up, and he was threatening our source, telling him basically, hey, I'm going to kill you. We need to get this fixed. Well, instead of killing his brother-in-law, he ends up killing their guy out of Mexico. 
and we find out about it on a wiretap. They're talking about it on the wiretap, and so we reach out to San Diego, and they provide they they their liaison gets in touch with Tijuana police, and they're like they get back to us, and they send us initial police reports, photographs. The guy was washing his car in his driveway, and they come up and shoot him, and they said, "Hey, here's what you're going to get. You're probably getting nothing more because the guy that you told us." is the, the guy that killed this guy. It's his cousin that's doing the investigation on the Tijuana side. So their cooperation with us is done. So th that was a really cool, I mean, just wide web of, of stuff. I ended up arresting a kid that uh, I had coached in wrestling in this case. Uh, just crazy stuff like that. Uh, it, it, it was really just an interesting time for sure. Uh, was... I, that was a great team to work with. Um, we had some really good uh, guys with the state police that were working that investigation and then really great guys from, from DEA that were working that investigation and from uh, immigration as well. Uh, we had a lot of fun um, during those investigations and, and during that time. And then, of course, you and I worked the case, Operation Spider-Man. Again, crazy case, right? Uh, we're... we're, we're buying pounds from a, a Mexican national and we're also buying you know ketamine from other guys PCP from other guys and they're all kind of loosely tied to one another in this investigation and and uh, I mean good times it, it, it was a great time honestly I probably got a little too big for my britches at times and thought I was uh, a, a little a uh, little more little better dope cop than I was, did some things that were a little bit reckless. And um, I remember Jack Catlin lining me out one night because it's uh, a, a risk I took, I thought was a very calculated risk. Apparently Jack didn't think it was as calculated as I thought it was. And I mean, literally chewed me out and really lined me out and, and kind of brought me back to realize what was really important. I, I mean, I just remember him telling me, you know, I'm not going to show up at your wife's house knocking on her door to tell her you got yourself killed because you were a hot shot. And he was the only guy that ever took me to task for the that kind of behavior. And I was like, man, and I mean, and he took, that guy could chew some ass, trust me. And he chewed my ass up one side and down the other over that. And I respected him uh, so much for that because it really did put things back in perspective of, you know, yeah, we're, we're out here, you know, we're doing... God's work, I like to say, but you got to you got to do it right, right? You can't take unnecessary risks. It's not worth that to your family. So, so following your narcotics career, basically, what what's your next step? What happens? So um, ultimately, we we end up with an opening for a sergeant in the department, and at the time, uh, I'll just be frank that the atmosphere in our sergeant or our, our department and the culture wasn't great. Pretty negative, pretty negative culture. In, in what way? Just, uh, guys complaining all the time, guys asking you, when are you going to leave this department and go somewhere else that's better? I mean, it was a small department and it was, it was rough. I mean, we had, you had sergeants and FTOs literally your first day showing up asking when you were going to leave this shithole. You're like, wow, what I sign up for, right? And at the time, I had a brother who, well, we had talked about him earlier. He was working at Boise City, and he was constantly telling me, you need to come to work here, you need to come to work here. And we'd had some, some officers leave to go to some different departments, Boise being one of them, just because of that negative culture. And I was looking as well. You know, I mean, I was thinking about leaving. And the uh, lieutenant told me, he said, hey, you're always complaining about the culture. And he says, you can either run away, and he goes, or you can try to make a difference and, and promote make a difference. And I'm like, dang, that's kind of a crappy thing to say to me right now. And so I was like, yeah, I, I'm going a, I'm to a test and test for sergeant. And so I tested for sergeant and, uh, you know, worked as a patrol sergeant, um, loved it really loved patrol sergeant work. Uh, had had some great teams working graveyards. We had some great teams that, uh, you know, everybody said we were lucky catching burglars, but 
I don't know. I just think I had some really good guys and, and maybe they're the ones they generated the luck that we had. But man, we worked at, at one summer rotation where we were catching burglars left and right. And honestly, I mean, we had people asking, how are you guys catching them? And I was like, I don't really know. I mean, we're just out there, you know, hustling, getting out in the in the neighborhoods and, and looking, really looking for them. And that was a, a great, great time that we had. Um, and, you know, as, as time started going on and, and we started growing a little bit, um, you know, started telling some of the other guys um, who I knew could help change the culture and professionalize things. I was telling them, hey, have you thought about putting in for this position or that position? You really need to think about doing that. We, we could, you know, we could make a difference here. And so guys did. They started promoting. They started putting in for different positions. And you could start to see a little bit of a, a split between the kind of the, the new guard and the old guard and, um, and for the better. And really, for us, the new guard, it was really a look out for your guys. Let's look out for our guys. Let's take care of the take care of our guys and gals, and make sure that we're moving forward. You know, and and at the time we weren't very well paid, and so um, a lot of us, you know, pre me being a sergeant and leading up to that, we're going and. and going to city council and trying to fight for wages and, and do all those things. And it was a slow, slow process. Um, and so, but we, we just kind of kept pushing that. Um, and so, you know, during that tri time frame, then, you know, people start leaving because they're getting uncomfortable. Some of the old guard are leaving because it is changing. Uh, training methods are, are changing. I, I'm, huge into the, the the training portion of it and um you know i i brought sim munitions back to the department for the first time and we did some sim munition training and and guys were coming out with welts on them and i had a lieutenant just lose his mind about oh you know these and i'm like they got bru are you kidding me they're bruises that's all they are right they had face protection they had all this they were they're bruises can you explain what sim munition is yeah so it basically it's it, it's just like a duty gun but it shoots a wax and paint bullet out at you it's not like a paintball gun it's not a it literally shoots a projectile that looks like a bullet and much more realistic cycles like an actual glock um just they're amazing. It's an amazing tool. And I had been training with a group called Gulas of Wrestling out of Washington. And those guys were so cutting edge. I mean, we did everything. We did simunitions. We did edged weapons. We did grappling. We did, and, and, and you did it all in the same scenario. Uh, we did, went to the conference one, one year and they literally had us put gear on and threw us in a, in a pool. And made you try to figure out how to fight in a pool and realize how quickly you're going to sink and so how quickly the the level of force has to has to rise in that situation and and i hate water anyway i was miserable uh, i hated it but i mean you, you had boots on you had duty gear on uh, you, you know it just was such realistic training you, you'd grapple in the mat room and then they'd take you out and throw you in pea gravel and now make you try to use your techniques that were great in the mat room and you're realizing what it, they're not nearly as great when you're stuck in this environment so how do you how do you fix those techniques to make them adaptable to that environment those guys were so so cutting edge uh, Don Gula Gary Drake I mean there was a whole group of those guys Rob Bardsley just and, and they're still going on right um, we've got to train across the country teaching their stuff. So I'm curious, you're chief of police now, but yeah. at that point, there's clearly something in you that's going, hey, we've got to keep up on what the latest and greatest is for police training and everything else. So do you start that as a sergeant or do you ever get into a position where you're handling training for the department? Yeah. So really it started with me as an officer. Um, just before I was becoming a police officer, all of a sudden UFC's taken off right and I'm watching you I'm like whoa this stuff's so cool and there's nowhere around here that's doing it at the time so before I'm even a cop I'm literally I'm, I'm pouring concrete and going to college um, and Hicks on Gracie 
is putting on a seminar in Portland, Oregon. And I tell my current wife, my girlfriend at the time, I'm like, we're going to Portland, Oregon. And she's like, for what? And I tell her and she's like, yeah, okay, whatever. And we drive over there and it's at the time they're just having literally torrential rains. They're having mudslides. It's a miserable drive over and back, but I'm going to do it. And I go over there and it's the first time I actually ever have contact with Don Gula or his wrestling group and didn't know who they were. They're this, these, there's this, these big old dudes and they've got these, these cool geese on that say Gula's a wrestling and it's a guy with handcuffs for hands. And, and I'm like, at the time, I'm not even sure I'm going to be a cop yet. And I'm like, man, these are big guys, right? And then I see Hicks on Gracie just quickly dispatch of them, right? And I'm like, oh, right on. This is cool stuff. And then I go back over there for a seminar because Fabio Santos, who was one of uh, Hickson's top black belts, he's doing a seminar. And I'm like, I'm going to go over there and learn something from him. And so now we're kind of just piecemealing it around here, right? Watching videotapes and doing different stuff. And so when I get into, uh, so I'm trying to teach. And it's interesting because at the time, I'm going to a, uh, I don't remember if he was a captain at the time, they changed structure during that time or a lieutenant, but he had kind of been our AT guy. And I'm going to him going, I want to go to a school. I want to do this. And he's like, oh, you should teach yourself. And I'm like, no, no, we should really go to a school, right? Go to an arrest and control school and do those things. And eventually I get to go to a school, paid my way to a lot of my own training throughout the years. Um, but it was worth it uh, for sure. And so uh, what happens is when I'm in NARCs is when I really start to get into it. A guy opens up a jiu-jitsu school down in uh, Fairfield, Idaho, of all places. And he's a, he's a, a black belt guy, and, and I'm driving two hours to go train with him. And I'm telling him, like, dude, this school ain't going to last down here. You're two hours from everything, right? You're two hours from twin. You're two hours. Come on. He's like, oh, no, it'll be fine. It'll be, it didn't last. I mean, you just couldn't get the, the volume in there. Uh, but luckily for me, a guy by the name of Craig Kukuk knew, uh, knew Lowell, who had the school down there. And he came down to do a, a video series down there because it was so quiet. And he had schools open on the East Coast with Henzo Gracie and those guys. He's the first American to get a black belt under the Gracies, uh, the number one of the dirty dozen, they call them. And he comes back up here and someone tells me, hey, he ends up moving out here from New Jersey. And somebody tells me, hey, Craig's got the school over on Overland. He's teaching. And I'm like, man, I'm going to go check it out. So I go walking in there, right? And I'm in, in Narcs at the time, long hair. And I walk in there and I'm looking around and I'm like, uh-oh. We've got a case on that guy, and we, I know that guy, right? And so Craig comes over to me, and he's like, hey, you want to check out the school? And I was like, hey, can I talk to you outside for a minute? So we step outside, and I show him my badge. I'm like, dude, I would love to train with you, but we've got a case on this dude and, I, and that guy and that guy. And he's like, what? You're kidding me. And he's a very – this guy is a huge law enforcement supporter. And I go, no. And he goes, all right, give me your number. So I give him my number. And it's literally like two weeks later, he calls me up and he says, hey, I've shut down the school over there. I'm going to be teaching out of my garage. I want you to be my, one of my first students. I'm like, absolutely. So I go over there and I train one-on-ones with him. And then other guys are coming in and we're all training out of that, that uh, out of his garage. And then he literally opens a gym right across the street, right here from, uh, from the PD. So talk about fortunate. I'm taking my lunch hour, going over there and training. After work, I'm going over there and training. I mean, it is just, I, I mean, I have lucked out. And so I'm, I'm training all the time. And uh, ultimately, he awards me my black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And um, he moved away for a while. And, but um I'm teaching here out of the police department to some officers and some, to different people. And, um, and then we, uh, I got my black belt in Kodokan Judo. So we're teaching Judo um, as well. To, to, we have a kids Judo program. And then we're, we've st we started implementing all that into our uh, police tactics program. And so very fortunate. Man, I've, I've got a cadre of instructors here that are 
unbelievable. Um, I've got a couple of black belts in, in jiu-jitsu, uh, brown belts in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, blue belts in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, former wrestlers, all really focused around the, the, the grappling aspect of it because I am a firm believer that people want us to be able to control people not to beat them into submission, right? There's a time and place to, to use strikes and do those things. But for the most part, I think if you grab a hold of somebody and you grab a hold of them and they feel that you've got a hold of them and you know what's going on, that is a de-escalation right there immediately. And, and through all that work, um, you know, as I moved up, right, it was easier to implement that training because you had more say. Uh, carotid restraints, right? It was forever told no. And finally, I got into a position where I could say, no, we're going to implement this program. And we did, and we still use it. It's extremely safe technique in spite of all the bullshit that's been put out there. All the science proves it's extremely safe technique um, for the suspect and for the officer. Less injuries, everything. And so we just, man, just started building that cadre up and the same way, uh, really, we've done with the command staff here is uh, I'm a firm believer. You surround your people, yourself with people that are a heck of a lot smarter than you, more talented than you, you'll be successful. As long as you don't care what, who gets the credit, you'll be successful as a leader. And I mean, I've been extremely, extremely fortunate that the people that we have in command positions and the people we have in our, our training positions, um, I mean, from the, the top down, we hire good people. We hire really good people. So question about the implementation of the grappling and jujitsu and all that other stuff. Has that, I don't know if you can quantify that, but has that led to a decrease in complaints? Yeah, yeah you know, um, I think our biggest decrease in complaints, honestly, has been the implementation of our body-worn camera footage. And maybe not a decrease in complaints, but fixing those complaints like that. Um, so just to back up a little bit, um, I go from being a, a sergeant to a staff sergeant, which was basically a lieutenant that they didn't want to pay lieutenant's wages. And how long did that take? Uh, it took a couple of years. Okay. And, then, and then they took the, the staff sergeant position and turned it into a lieutenant position. And so I was a lieutenant in patrol and uh, then moved into investigations. And literally, it, it's I'm, I'm gone for like 10 days teaching at uh, ILEDA, uh, Law Enforcement Educators and Trainers Association with the wrestling group. And I get back, it's my first day officially as Lieutenant over investigations. I sit down with my wife, she has not seen me for 10 days, sit down and literally she serves up my plate to eat and my phone rings and it's a patrol sergeant who says, hey, I think we got a homicide. And sure enough, We've got a homicide, and I'm like, "Sorry, honey, gotta go." And she's like, "You gotta, be, you're kidding me, really? You've been gone for ten days." And I'm like, "Listen, this is someone's kid, someone's father, someone's, you know, gotta go." And uh, so that was my first day in investigations, and uh, was a actually a really good investigation. Some guys came up out of Bakersfield, California, and ended up uh, beating this guy, trying to get him to move out of out of the house he was in. Um, because he was having some problems with uh, his female associate, his girlfriend that lived there. And they ended up basically ambushing this guy. He's a bigger guy, and they beat him up, and they ended up hog-tying him and leaving him face down on the floor in his kitchen. And they'd broken his nose, and he basically suffocates on his blood. And we end up figuring out pretty quickly who our players are and um, end up catching those guys uh, was a really, really good investigation by our team. Mm. Did a good job. But so was in, in at that point, um, I'm working as a lieutenant and uh, we're talking about bringing out body worn cameras and um, a lot of discussion about it at the time. And we had a, had a new chief, um, who would come in and he'd asked me if I wanted to be his deputy chief. And I was like, nope, I had no desire to be deputy chief. I mean, I, I, I didn't feel like I'd been a, a sergeant long enough and I didn't think I'd been a lieutenant long enough. It was just we, our department was exploding. I mean, we were growing. The city was growing um, and we were growing leaps and bounds. And so these positions were just 
coming open. So I was promoting way faster than I want to, and I told him no. So he went through the process of trying to find a deputy chief and didn't find anyone he liked. Came back to me, and I was like, nope, don't want to be deputy chief. <laughs> and uh, we thought we had someone that, that was going to, going to take the job, and then that guy backs out. And they go through another round of stuff, and he didn't like anyone in that round, and he comes back again, and I'm like, so then I started asking just mentors, people that I really trusted. Uh, Leroy Forsman, who was a, a, is a retired chief from Nampa Police Department. Mike Lowe, who was um, probably one of the best tactical guys I ever met. He was a BPD guy. Um, you know, to, talking to him, because I, I respected those two so much. Um, talking to my brother, talking, I mean, just talking to other officers in the department. And, you know, uh, I remember um, Leroy Forsman asked me, what does the position pay? And I said, I have no idea, Leroy, I haven't even asked. And he said, well, then you should take it because you're taking it for the right reason. And I remember Mike Lowe telling me, if you don't take it, I'll kick your ass. He says, because we always bitch about not having a cop's cop in a position like that. And he goes, you're somebody that could... I think you could actually make a difference and make a difference for the better. How long does it take you, Tracy, to get to deputy chief? Let's see, I'm trying to think here. Let me think. Probably about twelve years. It's pretty quick. Okay. Uh, not maybe not quite that. Maybe 14. Okay. Right so I know how sheriff's offices run where certain positions are political. Is the deputy chief, is, is that a political position? In it, terms of our, like, no. like the sheriff is, is elected, yeah. he can yeah. get kicked out anytime. And yeah. I think the deputy sheriff is the same kind of way. Yeah. So a deputy, sh deputy chief. Yeah, they, they, they could, yeah, they could, they could just say, the chief could say, you need to move on. Okay. But really, um, when I was in the position, it really, you never got those political pressures, really. Um, I wasn't really great at political stuff and it bit me in the butt a few times. I've learned a little bit over the years. Um, but I didn't have those types of pressures as the deputy chief, um, really. Okay. Uh, I, I was really given a lot of free reign on go do what you do. Um, I've been very fortunate. I, 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 again, I think because of my parents, I've been really good at being able to work with a lot of different people and, and forge those relationships without being super adversarial. I mean, there's times that you have to be, and I'm, pretty good at that uh sometimes maybe too good at that at times but uh i'm usually i've always been really good at kind of bringing people together even if they disagree with one another and so um you know just building those relationships within the department and making sure that uh, we were moving in the right direction and making sure we're holding people accountable right um i think a lot of times uh, people really they want to be held accountable and a lot of times what you'll see is departments don't ever hold them accountable and then the thing happens and it's like you're gone. And they're sitting there going, where'd that come from? Um, you know, I always tell people, you're, gonna, you're going to know if something's coming down the pike. It's not going to be a surprise to you. We're going to have had these discussions way before now. And, um, you know, <clears throat> for me, one of the, the things that I've always uh, kind of held as a little feather in my cap is, um, I, I've had to give some people some significant time off. I've had to punish officers. And um, I always tell them I have a short memory. When it's done, it's done. And one of our guys, uh, actually I've had a couple that have had some time off. And they both have told me, you know, you were the first person that came up to me and told me welcome back to, you know, welcome back. And you've never brought it up to me again. You've never held it over my head. And I'm like, I told you, uh, I have a short memory. When it's done, it's done. 
Um, if you continue to do things that you shouldn't do, yeah, is it going to compound for you? Yeah, but I'm not going to continually bring that up to you. We're going to work through it. Our job really as, as I think as FTOs, as sergeants, as any type of police leader, our job is to coach people up and to make them be successful, help them be successful. I always tell someone, if you're not successful, it won't be because we haven't given you every opportunity to be. Um, and man, we, we stress that from the bottom up. I, I, I'm always proud. We have, I, I tell every person that comes through here, if you're not successful in our FTO program, I guarantee you it will not be because our FTOs did not give you all the tools you needed to be successful and didn't give you all the opportunities. And I've had several people fell out of our FTO program and tell me, you were right. It wasn't because your FTOs didn't give me the opportunities. It wasn't because they didn't give me the training I needed. It's just too fast paced for me or this profession isn't right for me. And I'm like, yeah, our FTOs get it. They understand it. So where do you think your leadership philosophy came from? Uh, well, first off, I think it came from my parents, honestly, uh, on, on how you treat people. I, I think if you, if you treat people right, they don't want to let you down. If you, if you coach them and you mentor them, and I've had some great coaches over the years as well. I'm, I mean, I, I, I can't give it to one person. I'm, like I say my parents, um, my brothers have been great mentors to me. Uh, I'll use a guy, Jerry Sabala was a great wrestling coach and mentor to me. Um, Bob Milligan was a great wrestling coach and football coach and mentor to me. And just other people I've been around and watching how they lead and how they do things. I don't emulate them, but I take bits and pieces from them that I think fit into my style. Um, I can be very stern um, when I need to be, but I always believe that in the end, my job still to coach you up. It's it, I'll have that conversation with you. And, and uh, one of the guys told me, it feels like you're that you've let your dad down. And I guess that's a good thing, right? I mean, I've, I've had guys go, listen, when you get called into his office, if you've done something wrong, you're going to feel like you're getting talked to by your parents and you're going to feel like you let your dad down. And, and I've had a couple guys tell me that, right? Man, I'm sorry I let you down. And, and that's, you know, I, I get the, I'm going to get punished, but it, it bothers me more that I, I let you down. Yeah. So how, okay, so now, now you're chief of police. How... How long did it take you to, well, let's, let's do this. How old were you when you get, when you get promoted to chief? 51. Okay. Was there any surprises once you became chief? Is there any surprises or no, you were pretty much handling that kind of yeah. stuff when you were deputy chief. You know, um, well, again, one thing I will say that comes down to how you treat people. One of the things that I was super proud of, um, you know, when, when our chief left chief Levy, um, I was put in his interim and he was very supportive of them promoting me to chief and not opening it up. And he put it out there to him and was like, you're crazy. Your chief sitting right here. Um, but even more so, uh, some of the people that wrote letters in support of me were literally people that I'd sent to prison. Um, and I was like, wow. And it came back to, they said, the way I treated them when I dealt with them. Um, I had a guy that I helped send to prison for a homicide. And he's like, you know what? When I was in the, the dope world, you were the one telling me I needed to get out or I was going to end up in prison or dead. Right. And he ended up in prison. Um, he, you know, and he was like, you actually called my mother in Oregon to try to get her to try to help me get out of that scene. And, um, I had another guy who, who reached out to me and I'm super proud of this guy. He, he's raising two great, his, his, his boys and he's done, he sold uh, a stock dog, right? A cow dog for the most money that a cow dog's ever been sold for in the United States, for, or well, actually in the world. And it was for $30,000. And I think the last one he sold was like 40 or $50,000, right? At, at these dog trials, just crazy, amazing amount of money. And I'm like, that's pretty cool. And, and to know that you had a little bit to do with that, to, to treat somebody nice and tell them, Hey, listen, you can make something of yourself. You, you, we, you make mistakes. 
You know, and that's one of the things I try to stress to our officers as much as I can. Listen, are there bad people out there that need to be in prison? Absolutely. And they, they, a lot of them should stay in prison forever. But man, there are an awful lot of people that have made a mistake. They're not a bad person and they need a little bit of guidance. And if you treat them well, when you're dealing with them, it, it'll come back and it, it, it'll help you out. I mean, one of my biggest supporters I've dealt with on some mental, um, s some mental health crises on, and I didn't even remember the event. And he remembered it. He remembered the original event when I dealt with him and guys were maybe being a little too stern with him. And I walked up and was like, Hey, let's take the cuffs off him. Let's talk to him. And, and at the time, I think I was a Sergeant or a Lieutenant. I don't even remember. He, he remembered, he sure remembered, he, and he still reaches out to me, and we have conversations, and he's really one of my biggest supporters. And it's like, I just think if you treat people well in the long run, even on a call, right, you don't have to, I told one of our officers, because he can sometimes be over the top on the officer safe stuff, right? And I just told the guy, I said, you know, being an asshole is not an officer safety trait. It just means you're an asshole, right? You can be nice, still be very safe in what you do. And I tell our officers, if there is a time to use force, we are going to use force and we are going to win that confrontation. But we're going to be professional about it. We're not going to be screaming, calling them names, losing our minds on people and then treating them poorly when it's done. When the resistance is done, our force is done and we're going to dust them off and treat them with the dignity and respect that they deserve like every human being deserves. And you know what? The vast majority of our guys, I think, get it. We just hired a guy who had worked in the jail, and the reason he said he applied here is because the Meridian officers get more handshakes from the people they arrest than any officers from any of the other surrounding agencies that he's seen. Tells me guys are figuring it out. Yeah. And, you know, they're, they're, they're doing good things. And so, um, but... Coming into the job, you know, uh, I think one of the surprising things is is sometimes, you know, when you're trying to help some people, sometimes they don't want to accept your help, and um, they, not that you're looking for the appreciation because you stuck your neck out for them, but uh, you sure don't expect sometimes to get that uh, a disappreciation for it, and. Um, you know, we've had a couple occasions where we've had some people go through some rough things and we've helped them out. And some it's worked out great for, um, some it hasn't. And some, uh, rather than appreciate what we did for them, they kind of showed a little bit of a, um, almost like we owed them more. And it's kind of interesting because I've had to talk to some of our command staff and I always tell them, I go, listen, number one, you don't do that because you want it. To get it appreciation from them. That's not why we do the things that we do to help these officers out. We do it because it's the right thing to do. And if we have an officer in the same situation, we'll do it again because it's the right thing to do. I'll take the kick in the teeth when the kick in the teeth comes, even if it's not deserved, right? And I'll go, okay, it is what it is. But the next guy in, in that situation, I am not going to judge based upon um, your lack of gratitude or your lack of appreciation what, for what people did to help you. And, and most of the time, there are things that officers do, that command does, that you don't even know the lengths that they went to to help you and maybe even save your career dealing with legal and dealing with, with HR and other things. And... Um, but we don't do it for the appreciation, right? We do it because it's the right thing to do. And I think most people get it. I think most people realize it. And I, I think we see it in our agency, especially. We, we have officers that actually appreciate their command staff. And um, it's funny because in the last couple of weeks, I've gotten emails from officers or sergeants going, hey, you know, command doesn't get uh, uh, kudos very often um, just because of the nature of your job. But I want to say, Hey, this lieutenant and this lieutenant and this captain, man, they've really been helping me and, and we're mentoring through this problem that I'm dealing with as a, as a supervisor. I just want to let you know, I, I appreciate them. I appreciate that they did that. And we've gotten a, a couple of those lately. And it's like, yeah, that's right. They, they are trying to help you. They are trying to do those things. And I think sometimes officers, 
myself included as a young officer, you're like, oh, they're just trying to screw me over. They're not here to help. And it's like, no, I'm trying to get you to the end of your career. I'm trying to stop you from making mistakes that I've seen other officers make so that you can get to the end of your career and you can appreciate when you leave at the end of your career. There's nothing more sad than me than someone that leaves an agency and they're mad at the agency and they hate the agency. I'm like, why? Yeah. Why? Tracy, two last final questions that I always ask. Being in law enforcement for how long now? 27 years. 27 years. How did, how did being in law enforcement affect your family? Well, uh, they, they, I'll tell you, there were rough spots. There is no doubt about it. Um, early on when I was working undercover, uh, right, I wouldn't wear a wedding ring. Uh, my wife and I wouldn't hold hands when we were out in public because this Boise, the Treasure Valley was still a fairly small community. And we're dealing with actually some pretty heavy hitters, um, buying lots of dope and you may run into them in the mall. And, you know, there was an occasion where I told my wife, go to the car head home, make sure no one's following you because we see someone that I know. And I'm like, I'll call someone from the task force to come pick me up. And, you know, so those things were always a little iffy. Um, so that certainly affected it. I think there was a time, um, the job just naturally affects it. And you, you get so engrossed in this job. And especially when I was in NAR, I mean, I loved it so much. My brother still hates me for this. We're working a wiretap, right? And we've started, and I am so into this wiretap that I'm like, I can't leave, right? The mother load's coming today. I, I can't miss a day of work and I'm going to work. I'm going to come in even when I shouldn't be working because, I mean, it was just so fun. It was just so interesting to me listening to these phone calls, and these different things. But my brother, we draw bag, these two tags for mule deer. And uh, it's, and it's, it's, a trophy hunting area in Idaho. Not even going to say the, say the, the hunt that it is. And I turn, I'm like, no, I can't go. I had guys offering to buy my tag. It's illegal. And I mean, I literally have cops that I had cops that were mad at me that didn't even really know me that heard that I had drawn this tag and I wasn't going to, they were pissed at me. And so, and my brother's like, you're an idiot. You got your whole career, right? And now I look back and I'm like, yeah, I had my whole career to do that. And for me, the other thing really that had, had caused uh, some consternation in, in our marriage was when I was really trying to change our training program, right? And, and do the things that we really needed to do to be successful. And so I was training all the time. I loved jujitsu. And that's part of the reason I was training. But man, I wanted to make sure that we had no cops end up on that wall across the lot here at the, the police memorial at the State Police Academy. And in my career, uh, early on, I'd gone to several police funerals. Um, Mark Stahl, Linda Huff, um, the, the, the two deputies from Jerome, and was like, man, I don't ever want our officers to end up there. I want to make sure they have the best tactics and the best training. And the and sometimes I was over the top, right? Even with training officers, right? It was, you're, you're on them. And I'm like, man, that's not the best way to coach. That's not how you coach to get the most out of people. And so, but it did. I mean, there, there was a time, it, it definitely, it caused a rub in our, our, our marriage, no doubt about it. We went to marriage counseling. I tell officers all the time, go to counseling. You need to go to counseling. Don't be afraid to go to counseling. Go to marriage counseling. Go do those things and, and help get some perspective from somebody that's on the outside, right? Because you're telling your wife, well, you don't understand, right? You don't understand. I don't want an officer to show up over there. But she's sitting here going, you don't understand. You're gone Monday. You leave Monday morning. You don't get home till 9 o'clock Monday night. You leave Tuesday morning. You don't get home till 9 o'clock. You know, right? You're not getting home till late every night and you're leaving at five or six in the morning sometimes and then not coming home till late at night during the week. And then it's like, oh, it's the weekend. Well, we can do something Saturday afternoon because I've got jujitsu in the morning. Right. And so those are the things I think that you have to have a little more perspective about. And for me, I think uh, 
the one thing I disagree with that I, not the one thing, but one of the big things I disagree with a lot of old timers, and I still hear it from some officers now when they tell people, don't talk to your spouse about your day. Don't talk. To, I tell our officers, no, you need to talk to your spouse about what you went through today. You don't have to get into the gory details of everything, but they need to know what you're going through so they know why you're behaving the way that you are. You can't just go home and be a jerk and expect them to just accept it and go, oh, that's just the way it is. I, I, I need to be, you know, his verbal punching bag or his, he, I should just, you know, accept that he's going to be isolated from me for, no, you need to explain to them what you're going through. It, when, once I started doing that, man, it changed everything in that relationship. You know, I've been super fortunate. My wife has supported me in every step of the way and everything I've done in this career. And, um, you know, that I think is, is one of the things. And the other thing I tell officers a lot and not just our officers, I'll hear officers complaining about whatever with the job. And I always tell them, stop for just a minute and listen to yourself. You have, to me, being a police officer is the most noble career there is. I think if not the most noble, it is one of the most noble careers. I mean, who else goes out and puts their life on the line for people they don't even know? Who else goes out and deals with, honestly, 95% of our calls that aren't even going to be criminal complaints, but are going to someone's house, and it turns out that it's, it's a family that can't provide for themselves, and, all, and, and this officer goes after work and buys a ton of groceries and shows up at this house, puts them in their cupboard, makes sure they're taken care of, and, and leaves, and never wants anyone to know about it, right? Doesn't want anyone to know about it. And then we get the call a week or two later or a letter telling us about it. And you bring it up to the officer and they're embarrassed. They don't want their team to know about it. We should be celebrating those things. Quit focusing on the negative stuff and focus on the overwhelmingly positive stuff you've done and seen. How many times, using a tourniquet, when we went to TAC Med using tourniquets, right? How many officers have saved people's lives at motorcycle crashes or vehicle accidents because they put a tourniquet on a leg or CPR to a baby and you've saved that baby's life or you've gotten a lady out of an abusive relationship or you recovered a kid's bike which doesn't seem like a huge deal to you but it's a huge deal to them and realize that those little things that people bring to you and this is a huge leadership was a huge leadership moment for me right people come to me and I still have the problem though I'm like are you serious? That's what you're worried about? Seriously? That? And I have to remind myself, uh, a gentleman by the name of Stephen Gower had told me, he said, remember, the things that seem little to you or inconsequential to you may be the biggest thing in that person's life at the time. So don't just poo-poo it away, right? Listen to them and, and realize how big it is. And I have to do that all the time. I mean, it, it's crazy. The th and I'm an old school cop when I look at how we dress and how we do and I hear some of the complaints and, and some of the things we deal with and then I have to remind myself if that's the worst we have to deal with we've got it pretty good here. So Tracy normally I, I, I thin, uh, finish off asking the question um, but I'm going to switch it up. Normally I would ask you the question being in law enforcement for as long as you have how has it affected your uh, you know, your views on society from then until now. But I want to ask you a different question because you are the chief here. Knowing that obviously officers see bad things mm -hmm. and knowing that officers have to deal with things that the public doesn't deal with, what kind of resources yeah. do you give your officers to kind of get through not only the day but through their career? Yeah. So mental health is a, is a huge thing in law enforcement now. And I think one of the, the biggest things that we do is we, we just talk about it. Um, we talk about it a lot. Um, we, we, we offer them resources for counseling. Like I say, I, I'm the first person to stand up and tell people, I've gone to a counselor, you need to go. Don't be embarrassed by it. Uh, we, after any incident that we, we look at that we're like, oh man, that could affect that team. We do what's a critical incident stress management debrief. And we bring everybody from the, the uh, dispatchers to the fire personnel, to the paramedics, to our officers in there. And they can just talk their feelings out, talk about how it affected them. Um, 
And that has been a huge benefit to us. We've been getting large turnouts for those, and we try to do those on a regular basis when we see those things. Um, one of the other things, we, we have a, a crisis intervention team, which has a, a mental health professional on it, and he's also been somewhat of a resource to our officers as well, not just out dealing with mental uh, health crises calls. And we've started a chaplain program. Again, it's one of those things where it's somebody for them to talk to, somebody that just gets in a car that's not a cop, that isn't going to judge you uh, based on being a cop. Um, reach out to them on a personal level. I mean, I reach out to a lot of our officers on a personal level and just go, how are you doing? I know that was a tough call for you. Um, one of the things that we worked really hard to pass uh, two legislative sessions ago was a uh, PTSI bill where it actually falls under workman's comp. And so they, they can be off of work and seeing a mental health counselor um, for PTSI. And, you know, the, the old days of we're going to take your gun away and, you're, you know, you can't be on Medicaid. No, that, that's craziness. And so we really push for that. We've had officers utilize that and, and come back to work for us. We've had officers who haven't been able to come back from some of the uh, events they've been caused in. And that's fine, too. Uh, yeah, I always tell I've told those officers, you know, I don't want to see you on marriage number five and still be a cop. I want to see you on marriage number one with your family you have now and be doing something else that's that's beneficial to you. So I think those are, are huge things. And I, I think, though, too, you know, we have all these outside stressors. The George Floyd thing and, and, the, and, and that gets pushed on us. And we have to be willing as leaders to stand up and say, that's not us. That, that occurred there. That's not how we operate here. And you've got to be able to stand up and be willing to change, too. Uh, you've got to realize that there's some problems in, in policing, and sometimes it's it may be problems in a department. Uh, you know, our officers look and see what goes on at some of these places, and they're like, oh, that's crazy. Officers would never act that way. Oh, no, they would. That's why they are, right? They, yeah, they're not acting the way you would because we are very, very particular on who we hire, and our standard is very high and our expectations are very high. I tell people right from the very beginning what our expectations are when they come in. And I've pulled job offers from lateral officers because I've told them, no, I'm not going to waste our training staff's time. I can tell you don't believe in what I'm telling you. And I'm very firm on that. And I tell people, you may come here and you may fool us to get through the door. But if you start showing these other signs, we will move you along to somewhere else because it's not worth us losing that entire culture and that relationship with our community to to have a bad apple in here you know and it's tough times right now there's no doubt about it i had uh, one of our former uh, city councilmen said hey when you hit your 80 points are you gonna you're retiring right i said heck no i'm not retiring and he goes are you kidding me in this hot political environment why wouldn't you want to just retire and i said what better time to make change what better time as a police leader to be part of a positive change in law enforcement? Do I want politicians telling me how we should change or do I want us to drive that change so that when they come and they look at what we're doing, they're like, oh, you guys have got it figured out, right? And part of that 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 ability has been, right, USA Judo reached out um, and I'm on a USA Judo police task force helping develop a police judo program for, for officers to make it safer for officers, safer for the people that we deal with on a daily basis, right? In the end, what the public expects us to be are problem solvers. That's it. They want us to display some empathy. They want it. We're human beings just like them. We're coaches. We go to the same churches. Our kids go to the same schools. We want the same community they want. And, you know, I have a, a saying on my wall from Robert Kennedy that says, you know, every community gets the criminal it deserves. And what is equally true is every community gets the policing or the law enforcement that they demand. And I think that's true. Your community do, really drives what kind of policing that they want. And we know that in Meridian, they want us to make sure that we are uh, upholding the law, we're enforcing the law. And that we're doing it with dignity and respect with everybody that we come into contact with. And that, you know, they want us to be problem solvers. I tell new guys, I better not hear you tell anyone that this isn't a police problem and then walk away from it. Because your partner's getting the call from that same person on the next shift. 
you need to know the resources that we have out there to help them. If it's not a police problem, that's fine, but direct them to the resources that they need. I mean, it, it, it's, this is a great profession. And I think we just, you know, you have to emphasize people, not everybody's out there trying to kill you. Most of the people that we deal with are just like you and I. They've made a mistake that, that they've, you know, they've got stressors in their life. And remember, when we're on a traffic stop or when we're dealing with somebody and in that interaction, their perspective is never the same as our perspective. It's always going to be a little bit different. Their perspective is going to be molded on their past experiences just like ours is. Thank you, Tracy. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.